Hello, and welcome back to the Grapevine Gallery in our channel of events. Uh, again, I'm your host and owner, Clay Spear. I am thrilled to bring you our show today because this is really going to be a treat, uh, whether you have a novice or introductory level toward woodblock printmaking, or you feel like you have a firm knowledge point on it and you just want to really learn a lot more about the process. We have one of the best, if not the best in the industry, as far as knowing about woodblock reduction prints. Uh, wonderful person, wonderful artist, and we're lucky enough to have him join us today, Leon Lockridge out of Denver, Colorado, Dry Creek uh, area. Leon, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be here, and thank you, Spear, for putting this together and, and inviting me. I'm really honored. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is just a nice way, um, as we are dealing with the challenges of COVID, to try to bring an art show to everyone and bring it to you at your convenience, as we've mentioned before, as is give the artist's work a voice. And so we feel like this is a nice way to have art shows during this time and transition into the future of letting you get to know the piece a little bit better before you come in person to see it and talk to the artist about their work. So we've got a lot to talk about today, a few examples, both with a slideshow to share with you as you can see, and uh, you can see that Leon has a very wide range of variety, uh, oil paintings, prints, and then as you can see behind him, he's got a beautiful watercolor that we'll hear more about later, as well as some other prints. So without further ado, uh, Leon, if we can, can we start to maybe discuss a little bit your journey uh, toward, you know, becoming a printmaker? And we, there's also some more information we're going to get into with that later. But uh, just tell us a little bit about you, as, you know, and your journey to become, you know, such a wonderful printmaker. Well, probably um, out of high school, I went into uh, commercial art school and so I was really learning all the mechanics of producing art. Uh, it was more of a classical, how would you say, realism school. Um, the director was John Jellicoe, and he studied with uh, Nikolai Feshin. Um, and then from there, I went into the army for three years over in Europe and was a graphic aids artist over there. And then was on the general staff, and which was great because I got to do a lot of traveling when we would go out on maneuvers. I would drive the general's office truck out there and then follow him around doing sketches as he was going from event to event on these outside maneuvers, outdoor maneuvers. While in Germany in Stuttgart, they had a huge collection, print collection that I got really interested in and spent a lot of time um, looking at those and enjoying them. Um, and I ended up buying a press while I was over in Germany, sending it home and got home and started delving into etching and, um, and did that for quite a few years, quite a few years and was doing really quite well with the etchings. And then stumbled across an old letter press. And I'd always thought, you know, it'd be fun to start doing woodblocks, doing something with color. And so I started playing around with that, playing with color. And as I like to say, I went from the dark side over to the color side. Um, and just, it just opened up so many doors, um, doing these layers of color. Um, and eventually, after a few years, I ended up selling my etching press and buying another letter press. So then I had two of them and just really got involved in the color and had a lot of success with it. Um, and the more it's, it's so funny, you, you, you start learning a process. And as you're learning, you want to say something about a scene or you want to when I say when I say say something say that the phrase say something meaning create an image for me that's a statement creating an image and so as I'm wanting to say something about what I see in front of me I'm challenged by how much I know about process 
So then I have to learn more about process. And as I learn more about process, I'm able to say more. And once I'm able to say more, I want to, I want to say even more. But then I have to learn more about the process to be able to say more. And so it's just kind of a cycle that keeps going and it hasn't ended yet. Um, and that's the beauty of the process is it's just, it's, it's always challenging. It's always keeping me on my toes. Uh, there's always something new to explore uh, and something new to learn about the woodblock printing. Um, I mean, I've been at this for how many years and I think, you know, I've pretty well seen all the artists that are out there. And then you stumble across somebody, where did this guy come from? And he's Austrian, 1880, and never heard of him, but he's just glorious what they were doing. Um, so then you have to go into that and start learning what they were learning. Again, that opens up new doors about things to say and then once you want to have something more to say you need to learn more so it's just back and forth and back and forth and that's the joy and then that's pretty much brings me to where i am now well i think that's been a common theme with a lot of the artists what they've said through these talks is you know you, you do need to have your work say something and you know Roz and i just had a conversation you know where she was quoting wilson hurley and she said, you know, if your heart's in it, it will show. And it sounds like through the journey you've been through that you've really found your passion. And that's why your work is so fun to, to, to look at and collect is because you. you have something to say. you say there is your heart's in it. And um, in printmaking, you really do put a lot of heart and soul into it. There's just a lot of hours that go into making a print. And you just, I'm not sure you can work that many hours and not put something of yourself in it. Um, it's just, that just happens. Well, and you know, speaking of the process of creating a print and the heart and the, the labor that goes into it and the joy and, the, and probably there's a fair share of frustrations. Um, if anyone's ever watched Leon uh, in the printing process, and, and I'll let you take it away from here, but there's usually a number of pieces of paper he starts with, and he does have some visual aids to share with us that we can look at before the slides that may help people appreciate what we're about to share with them. But he'll start with this, and then he has no idea through this process what the series number is going to be. It could be 21, it could be 11, it could be 4, it could be 12. So, you know, if you'll kind of share that process of you know, with a few of the visual aids that we talked about before we yeah. started the show. Um, if you would share with the viewers kind of, I start with, you know, an idea or a sketch or a painting, and then here's my finished product. But Leon has some amazing uh, visual aids to share with us to, to help everyone appreciate how difficult this process is, but yet rewarding for when you see the beautiful final product. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually I really enjoy sketching outdoors. Um, I, I enjoy watercolors because they're mobile, they're quick. Uh, I used to do a lot of oils. Um, and it would take me 30 minutes to set up before I'm ready to paint. And by then the storm is blowing in or something's happening that, okay, well, I got 10 minutes of 30 minutes of painting in. <laughs> But with watercolors, I open up my kit, I'm ready to paint and I can capture a sketch. Some of the sketches I do are just small little sketches, just really small. Um, and it's not so much that you're, it's not the details that you're after, it's the big shapes, the abstract shapes that make up the painting, the color arrangements and all of those. That's what's so elemental. Um, details, you can throw those in all day and you don't really and it, it, we all carry our cell phones so you go click click and you have all the details you need but what you really need is that big shape those abstract shapes um that's gonna uh so once i get those sketches and i'm back in the studio then i start putting it all together into a wood block um 
this is a small little woodblock demo I put together. So this shows the stages and Clay will yell at me if, it, if it's not reading right for- <clears throat> No, it looks fantastic. And um, as, he, as he's going into this, everyone, it's called woodblock reduction and he'll go into that about the, the actual word reduction is because he's losing the wood and reducing it to add these layers, which is why that stack shrinks down. Yeah, and I'll get into that part of it, but I want to kind of introduce you to the basic basics of woodblock printing, which is this is an area that did not print is carved away. And it's the general term for woodblock printing is relief. So it's the relief areas that hold the ink, these printed areas. So on this one, this is a multi-block where there's a block for each color. So there's a block for the black, a block for the gray, and then a block for the ochre. And then you can see there's some red down here, a block for the red. And then in the final color, there's a block for the blue. But when you print the blue over the ochre, you get kind of a nice green. Um, so there's five blocks in making up this print. And you know there they all are. So many. Now what I do is what's called a reduction wood block. And so reduction meaning that I'm reducing the printing area of the block between each printing. So I'm carving away on the block between each printing. So on this one, this is the watercolor I started with. So you can see it's just a small little watercolor. Um, and it's kind of a guide, it becomes my roadmap what I'm gonna do. I drew, I transferred the drawing onto a few blocks. And then this is the first cutting and printing, a very light blue. So I printed this color over, let's say 40 sheets of paper. I then came back in to this block and carved it until this was printing. And then I take this printing and print it over the previous colors. And this is what I come up with. So now this is two color runs from the same block. So then I take this block and carve it once more. So now this is the third carving on this one block. So there's the third carving and there are the three colors printed together. And so now I've established the forms and the shapes in the image. And now I can start playing with color. Uh, and that's where I did a really, you can't really see this very well, but there's a pale rose into the mountain. And then I wanted something more dramatic. So I cut another block and that's this one. And you can see it's a gradation from a rose down to an ochre yellow. And once I put it over the image, you can see it really starts to jump. Well, I keep doing this, going back and forth between these blocks, carving and cutting, carving and cutting. And I'd love to say there's never a mistake, but there's always loss along the way. Things don't get quite done right. And then in the end, in the end, you finally find the end. That's what I came up with. That's the final print. Beautiful. So I think there's 12 color runs in this image. So in this and image- 12 you, color runs using three blocks. Three blocks. So I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna get uh, nailed on the question and comment section. Would you mind <laughs> sharing the actual location of the two visual aids we just went over and where those were um, with our viewers? This one is Nam Bay. Okay. So just outside Santa Fe, it's one of the, the older chapels around that area. And then this one is a uh, Trine Pass, which is up by Vail, Colorado. Simply beautiful. Uh, and so it's, you, and that's the beauty of it. it. This, because I'm always on the reduction, at, at one point I see like, this point, I'm deciding, you know, what do I need next? 
um, at this point, I said, I just, I've got the rose in there, but I really need something. I need to add a punch. And so that's why I cut this block and really threw something in there. And it makes a big jump from there to there. And, it, and so the whole process, the reduction process for me becomes very much like painting because I'm, there's an interaction with the painting throughout the whole process, as opposed <clears throat> to a multi-block. I've gone in and decided how everything is gonna look and once I have all these five blocks determined and their colors, then it's just a matter of production. Um, I get bored along the way, so I like to keep things spiced up and, and, and challenging for myself. With these different layers, um, obviously the paints and inks need to dry in the printing process. What's typically a time from when you put down you know, one run to where you need to wait before you can put another color on top. So when I first started printing, I was using oil-based inks. So Charbonneau is a French ink. They're really a great ink, linseed oil-based ink. Um, and I would print a color run. The first color run, depending on the weight of the paper, the thickness of the paper, the paper will absorb quite a bit of that first run. So you can usually on your first runs, you can get two runs in one day. And then you have to let them dry for 24 hours in between each run. Um, I started experimenting with the Japanese print process. So instead of using a roller to apply the ink, I'm using a brush and the ink is very different. Western inks, are oil-based, either linseed oil or walnut oil. A Japanese ink is, the binder is uh, rice paste, and then you have pigment and water. So it's a very simple mix. Mm -hmm. And you're applying it with a brush, a, a stiff-haired brush. Um, Western printing with the oil-based inks, you're using a press with a heavy roller on it to apply the pressure. On the Japanese process, um, this is my press, a baron. And I hold it like this and just apply pressure, hand pressure. So I don't need a press. Uh, well, this is my press. Um, and so with the Japanese process, which is what I use exclusively now, I can print five, six color runs in one day. Um, I don't have to worry about them bleeding um, or smushing together. It, so if you're using an oil-based ink, you have to give 24 hours to allow them to dry. If you're using a Japanese ink, you can just keep printing all day until you run out of daylight or time. Well, that's excellent information for everyone to understand is that <clears throat> through the Japanese process, you know, he is able to, you know, print more, you know, rapidly and run five or six runs a day instead of one color and then here and then here. Um, while we're kind of going from the Western to the Japanese model of printing with the press, um, I understand that you recently have sold your larger presses to specialize more in a Japanese style. Um, would you like to share with our collectors and viewers uh, about that that transition and and what led yeah. you to that more so than just the speed of being able to print but just enjoyment and everything else it's it's um so when i first started printing i bought a vandercook press and that was just a mere 600 pounds and then the next press i bought was a uh, washington style and that was almost 2000 pounds and and all of these presses are manual presses. So I have to do the inking and then the press applies the pressure, but I am the motor behind the press. Um, and then I bought one other press beyond that. And then I got into the Japanese style of printing. Um, and I just was enthralled by it. It's so exciting. 
the, one of the things about the Japanese process is that I am involved. It's a hands-on process throughout the whole process. I am applying the ink with a brush. I'm applying pressure by hand, how hard I press, how coarse my barren is. I can have textures under this, which will be more aggressive to picking up ink. Um, and so I suddenly realized these presses, all they're doing are holding the prints that I've been working on that. You know, I haven't used this one in three months. So someone was asking about it. So I sold that one and now I don't have any presses. I, you know, I got rid of the big monsters. Um, and now everything I have that I need to print with, with this process fits into a box um, that I can just, a little toolbox that I can carry. Again, the biggest thing for me and for the reason for making the switch is that the Japanese process is all about touch. I am directly involved in the creation of this work. Um, yes, I was involved when I was using the press, but the press was applying the pressure. The roller was applying the ink. Now it's me applying the ink with the brush. I can vary the ink. I can have it thick on the top, thin on the bottom. I can do a gradation which is very similar to what was happening on this one. So I'm, I'm going from a warm color up here down to a, a, a yellow. So I can do a gradation uh, with the brush. Now what that also means is that every print has variations from the other prints. They're not all the same. Um, and, and to me, they all become works of art, each one of them, because they're all done by hand. So it's, it, again, the big motivation is that I'm directly involved. It's just, it's all about me and the print and the paper, so. Well, that gives it a, a very nice, unique artistic touch to each handmade print, which I think makes them even more enjoyable. Um, with the Western style versus Japanese style of printing, if someone was just getting started or if someone was a painter and thought, you know, I think I'd like to start doing this, which one would you recommend they follow in your footsteps and start with the larger or should they just say, you know what, I'm going to be more involved with the process. Maybe I'll just go straight to the Japanese style. It's, it's hard to say. Um... And the reason I am reluctant is that it depends on who you have accessible to help you and teach you. Um, if you have someone who's really comfortable with the press and inking, and then I would sure go with that. Um, it's a slower process. It's either direction, going the Japanese style or oil-based, there's just a lot of time involved in translating your idea into these flat layers. And one of the things I've learned is that I would go out painting for four days, come back and then start printing. And I, it's almost as the paintings were coming into the prints and I'd be in the studio printing solid for a week and then I'd go out and print and paint for a few days. And it was like the prints were following me out into the paintings. And what I mean by that is that as I'm painting, I'm painting more solid panels, color fields, um, as opposed to having all these funny little modulations going on in the, uh, in the painting. Um, but then when I get back in the studio, I'm always looking for modulations to happen in the print, as opposed to having it just flat color runs. Um, so, but I would, 
it really depends on who you have available to help you learn. Um, I think it's, um, there's a lot to learn about touch on Japanese printing. But once you do, once you get comfortable with it, it's just the sky's the limit. There's so much you can do with it. It's really fun. So as you transition from the Western style to the Japanese style, <clears throat> how long was it before you got comfortable with the modulations and grading down paints to where you felt like, you know, I, I think I really enjoy this instead of, you, could, you know, you well, could go by, um, how long was it before I was comfortable? Or you could ask, how many sheets of paper did I go through before I was comfortable? <laughs> and uh, and there was a lot of sheets of paper. You know, you'd start with a great idea. This is gonna be wonderful. And you start carving and printing and you just it just is going downhill faster than you can save it. And, uh, and so you just let it go right into the trash can down the yeah. hill. And, uh, and you start over and you do it again. Um, it was a year, it was probably two years before I really gained a lot of comfort. Um, one of the projects that I did that really helped is I did a series of uh, books, folios, with a poet out of Santa Fe and each one. and. This is when I was really transitioning. So these are all, this is an oil-based print. Um, this is oil-based print. Uh, and I don't think there's a, but I started introducing um, some Japanese style prints into this. And this is a good one. Um, so this is an oil-based print, but then, Further in, I added a Japanese oh, wow. print into the folio. Oh, and there, this, the whole series is about the Rio Grande Gorge. Um, and another, oh, this is a fun one. Um, so this is, so each, each folio had a premier, a kind of a print, featured print. And so this is the gorge. And um, so this is all on a thin Japanese paper. Um, and this, actually this paper I buy from Japan from a dealer over there and it's all handmade. Uh, it was made in 1910. Uh, by some craftsmen over there. Um, and so it's over a hundred years old, that paper. Wow. Um, so it takes a while to, for you to get a comfort level with it. But again, there's, you get a comfort level, but then your desire to say more means you have to learn more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> with the, supply of paper coming over from Japan with all these shipping headaches that have happened recently. Uh, what's the availability with that paper right now? Is it still pretty prevalent or do you have to hunt no. it pretty good? I mean, it's, 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 um, when at first I bought a large stack of paper, I think there were 400 sheets in the stack. Um, right as the pandemic started, well, the Osaka airport was, closed down and they were limiting how much product was getting loaded onto each airplane. So I bought this, um, but then I had to wait six months for it to arrive. Um, and, uh, and I knew the dealer was good for it. And uh, so he was very patient and he was very, I was patient and then he was very thankful that I was patient, but. Uh, um, but there's there's enough paper here. There's enough paper dealers. Um, there's a few in California that have really good paper. So, and these are the one in California has newer paper. Um, 
And the difference between the old paper and the new paper is the old paper doesn't have much sizing. It doesn't have much glue in it. So it's a much softer paper. So you're, it's a more absorbent paper. So your colors can become muted. Where the newer papers, they add a lot more sizing. So they're stiffer. And what that means is with all that sizing, the color tends to sit on the upper levels of the page as opposed to soaking into the fibers of the paper. So the color is up on here. And so they tend to be brighter. Um, and they both have their benefits They're of working with them. They're, it's fun to work on a really nice white paper that just really makes the color spark. But then working on these old Japanese papers, they just are so glorious that just the color wants to be on that paper. Mm -hmm. so. That's really interesting. I, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know what you would call this international mashup of Japanese paper and Southwest imagery, but uh, it's, it's really kind of a fascinating combo. It's, I mean, it's, it's nothing really new. Uh, there was a printmaker out of living near Wichita, Kansas, uh, Norma Bassett Hall. Uh, she was in the 30s and 40s and she was doing the same process, the Japanese style print process. And her prints are just stunning, just gorgeous. Uh, she did a really famous one of of ship rock and uh, it was just wonderful. Uh, there's there's a um, Phillips uh, up in Canada. He was doing a lot of Japanese style printing. He couldn't get the barons or the brushes, so he was having to make his own. Um, he was still able to get paper though. So it's it's still, the products are still there. It's... So one last um, topic before we go into looking at these uh, short slideshow we have to share with everyone. Um, workshops have become a very popular thing in the art world uh, recently over the last 10 years, more specifically. Um, if, if you were gonna put on a workshop where you had the one folio you shared with us, where you had a watercolor, and then you were gonna work with students to come in and try to teach them, hey, there's this process that you realize a lot of these are probably gonna have to go down the line into the wastebasket, yeah. but, or we could recycle them and use them as a fire starter or something like that. Um, stay green, not to offend anyone. But right. if you were gonna have someone, would it be the best for them to have something painted prior to coming in there? Or would you wanna take them on location to feel those subtle nuances is of the imagery and then really bring that back because you had said earlier you painted for four days and you came back to the studio to print so if you were going to do a three or four day workshop how would how would the viewers say okay, if i'm going to go with leon this is what i can expect it's it's um so i'm doing a workshop this month here in denver and it's a two-day workshop or two afternoon workshop and when I first did one of these workshops, I had people bring an image that they wanted to use. Well, they got so caught up in translating their image that they forgot to pay attention to the process and, how, and what to learn about the process. And the first challenge is to learn about the process. It, it is so different from anything we've been taught in school. Um, but once you learn it, it's just wonderful. So what I'm doing in this, in the workshops I've been doing lately is I have a pre-carved block. I don't want them struggling with their own image. I want them struggling with the process and learning the process. Once they get home, if I do a good job and really teach them the process, then they can go home and you know, struggle with their image. But I want them struggling with the process when they're in the workshop. And that's one of the key things. If we had a whole week, a week and a half to do a workshop, if we had that luxury, 
I would still start off with let's learn the process. Let's get a feel for the process. And then we'll go out and do some watercolors and sketches or whatever you want and bring them back and translate them into what we've learned. Well, I think that's very wise too, to learn to trust the process versus being mad that you maybe bit off more you can chew with your carving and then you're trying to fix it. So my normal state of affairs is, you know, you know, going to the salad bar and making a mountain out of my plate and realizing I can't eat all this. And that's how I do it with my wood blocks. Um, and I still do it. I have yet to learn. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a process. And so, you know, even when you're at a mastery level like Leon, uh, sometimes you get a lot of salad. So, well, if everyone will be patient with me for just a moment, I'm going to share my screen and bring up our, uh, bring up our small slideshow here for Leon to go over a few images that he has available through the Grapevine Gallery. All right, share screen. I'll try and give you a little blurb about each one as I guess we're going through them. Okay. Well, I'm bringing it up now. I'll get it on slideshow mode here so that everybody can enjoy it. So this is... <clears throat> so this is Sunset Chapel, uh, but we seem to have lost the bottom. Yeah, I think it cut it off on us. Um, one thing but I it's, what I was so excited about was the sky and the bottom of the chapel is all in shadow. It's really kind of neat. But it was this this wonderful New, Mex New Mexico sky. Clay and I were talking about the sunsets down in New Mexico that are just wonderful. And so this is that just just playing with those sunsets. And it's all the Japanese style playing with those colors. Um, so there is a block for the blues. And then the clouds, the yellows and the oranges are all printed with one block. Uh, so you can see that the blue in the cloud is also printing the blue in the steeple. And then it's printing uh, the shadows, a blue into the shadows down in the building. But the, the clouds, that's all one block, but cut away multiple times in between each printing. Now, earlier you mentioned you use a brush to grade down color in your pieces. Um, would you like to point out to everyone how you did that in this piece, or I could be completely off base and you didn't do it? Um, well, let me get you um, one of the brushes. And not when we come back after the slideshow, I'll show you these brushes. So they're big, fat brushes. And so you can see that in the sky, there's a gradation. Uh, the shadow part of the clouds is kind of has a purplish cast at the top, and then it moves down to orange at the bottom. Um, and that's all one gradation. And that's, I'm doing it with maybe two brushes. And I'll show you the brushes when we come out of the slideshow. Okay. And uh, so you're, you can just get these wonderful gradations. Um, if you look at some of the old Japanese prints, they were just absolute masters of, of doing this, so. Well, and you know, here's what I'm the most fascinated about with this process being a Western style or Japanese style. And I mean, I, I understand that there's a, a learning process and you have to trust the process to be able to do it. But just the edges, you know, that steeple, the, the window going through there is so well done. And, you know, bringing these clouds together and these various hues in a printmaking, where, as you mentioned, yeah, there's not the smudge, there's not the, the run, yeah. the bleeding, but just that level of detail. And you're so good at it and you almost bring a grace to these prints. Um, I know that you're a big fan of another printmaker we carry, Alfredo Zalsi, who is also a master, and you're fascinated by some of his techniques. But I think in your own right, you know, you've done an amazing job with the elegance and the balance and the composition of your prints, and it's just fascinating to look at them. Zalsi was amazing, and he did 
did a lot of reduction prints as well. Um, it, it, it was it's funny to think that in printmaking, um, I kind of have the feeling that it's probably one of the processes that the end does just define the means. You know, I can, however I get there, not however, but pretty much however I get there to the end and make it look good is okay, as long as it looks good in the end. Um, so, you know, that's where the, the end does justify the means. Um, and so one of the things about keeping your crisp edges and keeping things sharp looking is learning registration. Um, and it's just like learning driving, you know, when I was teaching our kids how to drive, it was just, or especially our youngest, it was just like, it was, I don't know if it was terrifying or, but then it was hysterical. Um, but then, you know, the youngest who we struggled learning how to drive, he takes me out driving, but now he has a monster four wheel drive and he wants me to drive up this hill. And he's guiding me and it's like, I couldn't do anything right. He was showing me how to do, how to drive, you know, this little guy. And uh, so it's, it's, it's learning the little tricks that help you. And then suddenly you don't have to think about all this registration because you've got that part down. And now you can move on to focusing on other things. Well, I think that's an excellent way to explain the process and, and how to get to where you're trying to go and justify the means. Whereas on the last slide, we really zeroed in uh, to really look at some of those. We're going to back out on these next two slides uh, for Sun Geronimo and then Ascension that's coming up. So uh, take us through this process, the texture in the sky and the foreground and the shapes. Uh, just let us know how this one came to pass. So this is the chapel up in Taos Pueblo. Um, and this is, I did this specifically for a show at the Brenton Museum up in Wyoming, Cody, Wyoming, outside, well, it's in Bighorn, Wyoming, outside Cody, Wyoming. And the theme of the show was Graveyard Shift. Um, and I always was fascinated by this old mission at the Taos Pueblo with all the, the um, crosses out in front of the yard. Um, and so I was down there sketching and getting ideas. And then just, it wasn't at that moment, but I combined a, a cloud setting that I had seen somewhere down there on another trip. Um, and I just put the two together. Um, so again, on the, the mechanics of it all, the, the orange cloud is printed with one block and the sky is printed with one block. Um, now there's a lot of the orange under, underneath on, on the foreground, but um, just talking about the sky. So I printed that orange yellow and that's a gradation. So that's one shot printing to get those variations. So from print to print, that color variation is gonna change. But then if you look really close, there's all this detailed line work in there. Mm -hmm. It's really quite fun. Uh, it gives it kind of a nice textural depth. Um, and that's just all sitting down and carving all those lines. Um, and then the same went for the, uh, for the sky. Uh, I printed a pale blue over the sky and then printed a little bit darker. And then you can see it gets darker at the top. So there was a gradation printing. And then I printed all the line work over that. So again, there's two blocks used to print all those runs in the sky. And, and the same with the foreground, there were two blocks to print everything. Now, is this the same paper as the first slide we saw that had a little softer color? Is this the other paper that has a little the, brighter color to it? The paper on um, uh, Sunset Chapel, that's a newer paper. That's 
that's yeah, that's a new paper. It's, so it's a brighter paper, a white paper, and it has a lot of sizing in it. The paper I use for San Geronimo is one of the older Japanese papers. And so it tends to mute the colors out. Um, so I end up putting a little bit of white into my color, especially up in those sky areas, just so that they have some a base to pop out from the paper. Um, but the paper is so soft and just so receptive to colors. It's really quite wonderful. Well, and I just, there's, there's so many things going on in this, this piece of art that, you know, the gradations, the, where you did a very painterly uh, adjustment with the paper and also that of a printmaker to put that white up there to hold those colors and make them pop and then, you, you know, use it to create shadows and, and really manipulate light. And that's really what all the master artists do is they're able to control the light like they want to. And so I think you did a spectacular job of that as well as the carving and the detail, which I cannot imagine how long that would have taken. You just, you don't think about it. You, uh, you just have to turn off time, have something good to listen to and start. And the minute you start to rush, it goes wrong. Uh, but if you just take your time, it'll all happen right. Uh, it certainly has in the first two slides, as it will with this third slide. Um, <clears throat> not to try to talk too much as a host, but as Leon's talking about this piece, I want everybody to understand when you look at how good this piece is, um, look at the birds coming up through the mountain, look at the detail work in the foreground down to the left, and then look at the mountains with the snow cap tops. There is so much amazing detail going on in this piece that it's just fascinating, not just from the composition and the painterly aspect of this piece, but the absolute detail and just the logistics of what Leon had to do to create a piece of art like this. So Leon, I'll let you take it away from here. So this is the San Luis Chapel in Southern Colorado, San Luis, Colorado. Um, it looks ancient, but it's actually really new, built uh, 1984 by the Padre down there who was trying to get something happening in that poor community. And it sits on the mesa overlooking this valley. It is just stunning. And I've painted this who knows how many times. And ever, every time I go down there, I said, okay, well, I'll go up there and look. But, you know, I've got so many paintings of this. I don't want to, I just, I don't need to do another one. Well, you get up there and it's so gorgeous, so stunning that I do another one. And, uh, and that was kind of what happened with this wood block. Um, and again, this was for the show up at the Britain Museum, Graveyard Shift. And I wanted something lighter as opposed to gloomy and doom. Um, it's just, it's so uplifting at this location. You have the mountains, the Sangre de Cristos, and these cloud formations always are around there. And then this white chapel just seems to glow the whole time that you're there. Um, so this just really took on a lot of meaning for me. It's, it's such a special place. Uh, just the mechanics of printing, I printed the sky areas first and then moved into the, the background mountains. And then as I'm doing the background mountains, the, the foreground areas start to get defined. And then I started working into the darks. Um, and it's, it's interesting um, when I, I do some watercolor workshops as well. And one of the things I really promote when I'm doing those watercolor workshops is do not paint detail. Just don't, you, you can suggest it, but don't go painting detail. You'll just, you'll kill yourself doing that. Uh, and you'll kill the painting as well. Um, so suggest detail. And that's all that I've done here is suggest that there's detail. And it's amazing how the viewer will fill in all that detail for themselves. And you may have three different people with three different ideas of what's there. Um, 
you know, and, and uh, you know, what kind of birds are those? You know, someone may have a very definite idea. And uh, my idea was that they're birds. I don't know what kind of birds they are. Um, but so it's just a matter of suggesting detail um, and just the movement of this kind of ethereal flight of birds coming out of the chapel was really kind of exciting for me to see. Well, and me too, <clears throat> you know, the suggestive lighting of the clouds as the, you know, the sun may be fighting through with the grays and the lights in there. I really like how you did those, especially with the depth of the piece. Uh, if you look for this first mountain, part of the mountain range, and you can tell it kind of breaks before the next ridge pops up there. That depth, that uh, adjustment of light is what's so good about this. And it just really brings a, a level of depth to this piece. Um, again, I wish I wish we could uh, take everybody there and just sit them down and just watch the cloud play and the lights play around this chapel. It's just it'll go from being washed out to just stunningly beautiful. And and uh, I mean, my wife and I were down there once, and it just the light was just so magical. We were just, our, we were just in awe as the sunset was happening. And then all of a sudden we went, oh, yes, yes, cameras. And by the time we got the cameras out, it was gone. <laughs> well, so and capturing that moment is, is what's, uh, you know, the tricky part in fine art. And getting that motion is the tricky part. And I think really with the light of the clouds and the birds. And like you said, let the viewer fill that in. You can feel the motion of this piece. Good, good. I said, it, it was, it means a lot to me. This place is absolutely magical. And there's places in the world that just seem to have a spiritual connection, um, uh, definitely for me. And this is definitely one of those magical places. Well, you certainly captured it. And we thank you for going over the details of how it was created so we can appreciate it that much more. Well, this next part, I'm gonna hit my stop share and go back to our dual view because Leon's promised to treat us with talking to us about his brushes that he uses so we can kind of get a better understanding of how he's grading, grading the colors down. Yeah, so these are the brushes and you can see they're kind of squarish. Um, so this is about an inch, and then I have a bigger one, this big, and then I have an even bigger one of this, and then I have a smaller one, just a really small one for little areas. And so the idea is, if this is my block, I dab some color on here, and then I'm brushing the color out. And you're saying, well, how do you know, how do you get it on just the top areas? Well, you're getting it kind of everywhere and you get used to skimming over the top as opposed to pushing the bristles down into everything. But ink does get into the low areas. But the thing about the paper is when it sits, this, these are the carved out areas. When you drop the paper on, it spans over those low areas and just sits on the raised areas. And then when I put my baron on there, it applies just enough pressure to transfer the ink. But these are the key to getting the color on there with these wonderful gradations, the brushes. <clears throat> well, and again, with this incredibly fascinating process, that's where Leon was saying that he may start with this kind of a stack of paper, but then the finished product may be substantially less. And you just kind of have to stay patient and don't get in a hurry because that's when he said mistakes will tend to happen. So, so uh, yeah, I end up with a. So if you walk around one of my exhibits, you'll see just an odd grouping of, of um addition numbers, you know, I'll go from 12 to 18 to 22 to 17. It's like, is there any rhyme or reason? And the rhyme or reason is that at the end, when I'm all done printing, I count up how many good prints I have. And that's the addition. 
because in when I do that first reduction, there is no going back. There is no reprinting. Um, on a multi-block, yes, you can reprint because there's a block for each color. But on a reduction, once you do that first reduction, uh, there is no going back. And uh, so at the end, when you count up all the good ones, that's how many you have. Well, there you have it with the uh, with the science of the numbering. So yeah. um, let's talk about the some of the pieces you have behind you, especially that gem of a watercolor. And uh, you can share with everyone. Um, yes, yeah. as we mentioned earlier, he does oils, watercolors. It's behind him, prints that are over both our shoulders. So I can uh, bring this up a little closer. So this is uh, um, a little so something I did. I was out working for doing some imagery of the um, the Santa Fe Trail. And this is along the Cimarron branch of the Santa Fe Trail as it went through northeast, northeast New Mexico. And this is called Clayton. And this is one of the big campsites, watering areas that the wagon trains would stop. And there's a campsite there that I stayed at and woke up one morning and, and woke up to this. It was just stunning. So, just beautiful. Yeah. And then, um, and then this one behind me of this cloud, uh, that's uh, the Rio Grande Gorge. Um, that, let's see, I was gonna grab a image here. Oh, oh. That kind of started out from, a from one of these books that I did, and I did this fun little front piece, and that's the image. But you can see how small it is. Mm -hmm. and, um, so everybody kept saying, "Well, when are you going to do a large one of that?" And so I broke down this spring and did a large one of it, released it this summer, and it sold out immediately. Um, wow, congratulations. Yeah, uh, so that was a fun <clears throat> one. Um, on this image right here is a fun one. I did as a study for the Kaus Sharp Museum in Taos. And I did this print for them as a fundraiser print. So this is um, Kaus's easel. And they have the whole studio set up where he worked and everything. And this easel sitting there with a the painting on it. And so I did this as a fundraiser for the print. And again, it's a reduction print. Um, so this is the start of the print. These are the first colors in this window. And then it just built out from there moving toward light to dark. Um, it was something I was really proud of that, I mean, there's a lot involved in this image. Oh, to get it. goodness gracious, yes. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much, I mean, we can go on forever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and I, and I enjoy your work so much. I, I, I'd probably make the show two or three times longer than it needs to. It'd be like, hey, I saw some in a reflection. What are those? But um, That'll, that'll be a show for another time. But um, yeah. what's uh, what's up next for you this this holiday season and going into the spring for next year? Well, we have, um, so I think the, uh, the show up at the Britain Museum just opened. And there's what, five pieces up there, four pieces up there. And then there's a show down at the Albuquerque Art Museum that I'm involved with. Um, and then there's the Coors Western exhibit coming up in January. And then at the Wichita Art Museum, there's a, a, an amazing show being put together by Barbara Thompson. Um, and it's called Now and Then, a kind of Renaissance of Block Printing, 1922 to 2022. Um, and so it really records a lot of the prairie printmakers that were in that area, in the Wichita area, 
and and then invites i think there's eight contemporary artists that have been invited into the show as well um so i mean the the show is going to be really fairly extensive um and there's she wrote a catalog that's probably 300 some pages long wow. for it it's really going to be a show of shows and that opens late february and goes through august there'll be a symposium in june of 2022 and i'll probably be giving a talk or something there during the symposium well, are there um, any workshops coming up that you'd like to share with me and i've got a workshop and uh next weekend here in denver um and then there'll probably be one in the spring here in Denver as well, in conjunction with um, the month of printmaking, which happens every other year here in Denver. Yeah, I remember that was a, a, a great show a couple of years ago. We sent some work out with you and that, that yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, and you sent, you, um, Play was nice enough to send out um, a bunch of the Salsa prints. And we had a big show of those at the studio. And uh, oh my goodness, we sold a bunch of those. Yes, so. he did. <laughs> well, <laughs> the greatest in the business was the one talking to everyone about it. So he, he was able to explain things better than I could. But um, well, Leon, thank you so much for your time today. I uh, really appreciate you sitting down and going through this fascinating process with our viewers and collectors and even aspiring printmakers. I feel like everyone learned a lot today. Well, hopefully you did. And, and uh, if you have any questions, contact Spear or let me know. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. And just remember the slides that we saw today or any other Leon's pieces that you're interested in collecting, those can be collected by calling our phone number 405-528-3739 or simply going on our website and you can get our phone number email, which is grapevineGalleryOKC.com or you may email me directly at clay.grapevine at gmail.com. Sorry for all the small print talk here at the end and try not to ruin a good show, but uh, would love for everyone to collect some of Leon's work and uh, that's how you can do it. So Leon, once again, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Clay. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.